Hello, my name is Mazen Alsvar, and today we'll be talking about the anatomy of the upper limb. This will be part one of the series. So I'm going to propose a structure today on how to learn your anatomical structures. So you need to know the proximal attachment, the distal attachment, the innervation, and the function or action of the structure. Today I'm going to concentrate on the shoulder and upper region of the upper limb. I think these are important structures. We're going to concentrate on the rotator cuff muscles and the brachial plexus, which supplies most of the muscles in the upper limb. So why are they called rotator cuff muscles? So along with their corresponding tendons, these four muscles surround the glenohumeral joint and protect and stabilize the joint by holding the glenohumeral head. The best mnemonic to memorize is SITS. There are four main muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. We're gonna go through each muscle using the structure that I proposed in the previous slide. Supraspinatus, its proximal attachment is the supraspinous fossa of the scapula. You could see that in highlighted in red in the diagram here. Supraspinous fossa, meaning above the spine of the scapula. This distal attachment or insertion is into the superior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. It's innervated by the suprascapular nerve. And its main function and act or action is to support the humeral head and abduction as well. Moving on to infraspinatus, again, infra meaning below the spine of the scapula. Its proximal attachment is the infraspinous fossa of the scapula, and it inserts into the middle facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. It's innervated by the suprascapular nerve again, and its main function is, as always with all the rotator cuff muscles, is to support the humeral head and also lateral rotation. Teres minor. Its proximal attachment is the lateral border of the scapula, which is shown here in this diagram, and it's inserted into the inferior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. It's innervated by the axillary nerve, which you can see here in this diagram. There are several branches of the axillary nerve in this diagram. You can see the superior branch, the inferior branch, and the cutaneous branches. But you can see this little branch curling into the teres minor, which is uh, supplying that muscle. Its function or action is to, again, to support the humeral head and for lateral rotation. The easiest way to remember this muscle is that its action is identical to the infraspinatus muscle. And finally, subscapularis. Its proximal attachment is the subscapular fossa, and it inserts into the lesser tubercle of the humerus it's innervated by the upper and lower subscapular nerves, and its main action is of medial rotation and adduction. So that concludes the rotator cuff muscles. Let's now move on to the brachial plexus. A lot of medical students find this topic very confusing. But again, the best way to um, learn this topic is to draw it. And they're the structure to memorizing this, um, this network of nerves. The structure I'm proposing is to separate the different uh, components of the brachial plexus. So let's start with the rami. These are C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. And they give off what we call the trunks. So there's the superior trunk, which is formed by C5 and C6, the middle trunk, which is a continuation of C7, and then the inferior trunk, which is formed by C8 and T1. So let's look at the cords now. There's the lateral cord, the posterior cord, and the medial cord. Now the lateral cord is formed by the anterior division of the superior and middle trunks. The posterior cord is formed by 
the posterior division of all trunks, of all three trunks. And the medial cord is a continuation of the anterior division of the inferior trunk. Now, of course, these cords give off several nerves that supply a lot of muscles in the upper limb. So let's look at the lateral cord first. We have the lateral pectoral nerve, which supplies the pectoralis major and minor. We also have the musculocutaneous nerve, which supplies the biceps brachii. And then we have the lateral root of the median nerve, which forms this characteristic M shape that we see in the brachial plexus, which I'll show you in a moment. The medial cord gives off branches of the medial pectoral nerve, which supplies part of the pectoralis major and minor, but also gives off the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, which supplies the skin on the medial surface of the arm, and also the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which supplies the skin on the medial side of the forearm. We also have, most importantly, the ulnar nerve, which, as you know, supplies the um, muscles of the forearm and also the hand. We also have the medial root of the median nerve, which, as I said previously, forms this characteristic M shape that we will see in a minute. Then we have the posterior cord, which gives off the upper and lower subscapular nerve, which we talked about previously, and then the thoracodorsal nerve, which supplies the latitimus dorsi, which is the largest muscle at the back. So let's have a look at the brachial plexus on a prosection specimen. As you can see, we have the rami C4, C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. And they form these trunks that we were talking about previously. I'd like to, to note the cords, which are the most important structures. You can see the lateral cord and the medial cord forming this um, M shape to form the median nerve. And also you have the ulnar nerve and the radial nerve, which you can't see on this diagram, which are very important structures. It's important for you to see these structures in your dissection lab to truly know how these muscles function. Thank you for listening to our podcast today. Uh, please join us next time for the second part of the Upper Limb Anatomy series.